Now that the enemy is set up, let's give it a path to follow. We will create a proper level further on, but for now I will manually set up some waypoints. So just underneath here where I'm creating my enemy group, I'm going to add a temporary section where I'll create a list called waypoints. And inside this list is going to be a combination of X and Y coordinates. So we'll put 100 and 100, then another one which will be 400 and 200, 400 and 100, and then the last one will be 200 and 300. And you can play around with these, you can set whatever you like, because these are just temporary waypoints that we'll use for the time being. And just so that we can visualize these waypoints, we'll draw them out as a set of lines. So just after I fill the screen with this white color, I'm going to add a section here which will say draw enemy path. I'll call pg.draw.lines. I'll draw it onto our screen. I need to define a color, so we'll say gray zero. The next argument is whether we want to close the lines as a polygon or just a series of lines. So I'm going to put false so that it doesn't close it as a polygon. And lastly, I'll pass in my waypoints list. If I test this out, we should now get these waypoints drawn up on the screen. The next thing to do is get the enemy to actually follow these. So I'm going to pass the waypoints list into the enemy instance when I create it. At the moment, we've got this manually created variable that's used as the position. This is the starting point. We'll delete that and we'll pass the waypoints instead. And of course, now we need to update the enemy class because it's expecting X and Y coordinates to appear in this pause variable. But now instead we're sending in a list. So we'll change that to say waypoints and we'll assign that to a self variable. I'll say self.waypoints is equal to waypoints. Using this waypoints list, I can now extract that pause variable that we had to begin with. So this is the initial starting point of the enemy. And that's just going to be the first index, or rather the zero index in the waypoints list. So we'll say self.waypoints at index zero. And lastly, I just need to change this here to self.pause. Now I can run the game again, and the enemy starts off up here. Of course, he doesn't follow the lines yet, but he's starting off in the correct point. Now one challenge with these waypoints is that they create an angled line between them. So to work out the angle and to work out how to move the enemy across these lines, we'll need to do a little bit of maths with a bit of trigonometry. But fortunately, Pygame does have a built-in module that makes that easier. That module is called Vector2. So in the enemy class, we're going to import from pygame.math the module Vector2. Now I can change this self.pause variable into a vector. I can add vector2 and wrap it in brackets. And now nothing actually changes from the look of it. It still starts in the same point, it runs the same way, but we do have a little bit more functionality now on this self.pause variable. For now, you don't need to worry too much about this, but as we progress, I'll explain what the functions do. Now let's get the enemy to actually follow that first line. So let's get it to move from the initial starting point onto the next waypoint. Well, we've got the initial starting point here in this pause variable. So let's define the target say self.target underscore waypoint is going to be waypoint one. Now you could say that, well, it's already at the first waypoint, so there should be two, but because we're working with a list, waypoint zero is where everything begins. So waypoint one is going to be the next one to move to from that start point. We can now use this to define a target for the enemy. We'll go into this move method again and add a comment to say define a target waypoint. And this target is going to be self.target is equal to and again, here we're going to use vector2. So we'll have vector2 for the current position and vector2 for the target position. And the target is going to be taken from the waypoints list because that's where all of the waypoints are. And the index we use is the target waypoint. So we begin at index zero, that's our starting position. Then our target waypoint variable is one, which is what we put in here. So our target becomes the next waypoint. We can now use those two variables to work out the distance between them. I'll say self.movement is equal to self.target minus self.pause. And we don't need this section anymore because we're not just having the enemy move slowly across the screen. So for now, let's just print out the self.movement variable and see what it is. If I run this code again, at the bottom you see it displays 300 and 100. Well, if you look at our first two waypoints, the first one is at 100x and 100y. The second one is 400x, 200y. The difference between them from 100 to 400 is 300 and 100 to 200 is 100. So that's what this new variable here is showing us is a distance between the two waypoints. So what do we actually do with this? Well, like I mentioned before, we could use trigonometry here. So we could use this 
300 as the x distance, 100 as the y distance, draw that as a triangle, use Pythagoras to work out the angle, and so on. But there's a much easier way to do it using vector2 methods, and that is the normalize method. So instead of printing out just the movement variable, we'll add normalize at the end of it. If I now run this again, we're going to see slightly different variables. That normalize method has done all the trigonometry work for us. So what it now says that if we want to follow that path, then we need to move along by this many pixels and move down by this many pixels. We can now use that to move the enemy. So we'll remove these brackets and we'll say self.pause is increased by that variable normalized. And lastly, to be able to actually position the rectangle and move it around, we need to say self.rect.center is equal to self.pause. So just what we did when we first initialized it, since the self.pause variable is updated, the rectangle center also needs to be updated. Run it again, and now we can see the enemy is now following that path. And now since the enemies are going to be different throughout this game, some of them will move faster than others. So what I would like to do is add a variable here called self.speed. For now, I'm just going to set it to a fixed value, but later on, this is going to change depending on the enemy type. And we can use this speed variable and multiply it here, self.speed. So now the enemy position is going to be updated a little bit faster based on this variable. If we test it out again, you can see it moves over a bit faster. Now we've got the enemy moving along this line, but what happens when it gets to the end of that waypoint? We can see it kind of starts just oscillating around it. Rather than moving on to the next one, he just seems to bob all over the place. What's happening is that he overshoots it slightly, and then in the next iteration, he looks backwards, moves back again, overshoots it again, and essentially just keeps going back and forth, never really reaching this waypoint. The reason that happens is because the distance between the player's position and that waypoint is less than the actual movement speed that we end up with here. So actually what we need to do is every step that the enemy moves, he needs to look at how much room or how much distance is left until he gets to that target waypoint. And that way we can adjust the movement so that it doesn't get overshot. So after we calculate the movement and before we update the position, we're actually going to separate these out because we need to add another little section here. And this will say calculate distance to target. Now this again could be done with some simple trigonometry, but because we're using vector2, there is already a method that will help us with this. I can say the distance is equal to self.movement, which is that vector between the current point and the target point, dot length. Now let's actually test this out. So we'll print this distance variable. We run this again, and as the enemy moves, you can see it's quickly dropping down. And eventually, when it gets to that waypoint, you can see it's kind of hovering around. It never reaches zero, so it's always just either side of the waypoint. Well, now we can do a little check using this distance variable. Add a comment to say check if remaining distance is greater than the enemy speed. So if dist is greater than or equal to self.speed. Well, actually, that means that there's enough distance remaining. So in this iteration, when the enemy moves, they're not going to overshoot the target. So we can do what we had before. We can move this section back up here into this if statement. Otherwise, so we'll have an else in here. If that isn't the case, then we don't want to move by the full speed amount. So we do take this line, copy it back down. But now instead of moving it and multiplying it by self.speed, we actually just limit it to the distance. And this means that once the enemy gets close to the waypoint, if it's only a little bit remaining to the waypoint, then it's only going to move by that little bit. And the result is that he's gonna land exactly on top of the waypoint. Let's test this out and see what happens. So the enemy moves along like before, gets to the end, and now we throw an error. Now the error is happening in this new line that we've added. And the reason that's happening is that the enemy has reached the target. So now distance between the target and the position is zero. So that means that this variable self.movement is zero and we can't normalize a zero vector. That's what this error is telling us. But of course, if the enemy has reached that target, that means that we need to set a new target. We need to move to the next very waypoint after that. So just under this line, we will say self.target underscore waypoint is increased by one. If we run this again, we now see the enemy moving along and at this point should move to the next waypoint. Now we get the same problem on the next waypoint instead. So why does it happen there? There will be some instances where the enemy arrives exactly on top of the waypoint using its own self.speed. So this section here never comes into it until the enemy is already there. And that means that the movement is already zero and we try to normalize it leading to this error. 
So we need to add another if statement here. We'll say if dist is not equal to zero, then we do this. So it's basically just a little error check here to catch this potential risk. If we run this again, the enemy now follows to the first waypoint, up to the second, and it continues on to the next one. So now we're getting the enemy to follow all of those waypoints correctly. Of course, when we get to the end of the path, we are still getting this error, but that's simply because we haven't accounted for that yet. So we need to go back into the enemy class and make sure that there are enough waypoints remaining in that list. And we will do that within this first section up here, where we work out where our target is. Before we do that, we'll say if self.target underscore waypoint is less than the length of that waypoints list then we can indent this section in here. So essentially this is saying that as long as we actually have those waypoints available within the waypoints list, well then that's fine, we'll set a new target and we'll calculate the movement variable based off that. But if that's not the case, well that means that we've arrived at the destination. So enemy has reached the end of the path. And at this point we just want to delete the enemy. To do that, we just say self.kill. This is another method that we've inherited from the sprite class up here. So it's going to automatically remove this instance from the sprite group. Now we can run this again. The enemy follows the waypoint, go to the first one, second one, and when it gets to the end, it disappears. Now at this point, we've got most of this working. The only thing that I would like to do is actually have the enemy rotate to face the correct way. So right now, we're just always pointing to the right, but I'd like it to follow the lines as it goes. So to do that, we go back into the enemy class and there may be a vector method for this, but I'm just going to use the math module. So we'll import math and then we'll use a little bit of trigonometry to work out that angle. So I'll define a new method down here and I'll call it rotate. So we'll say def rotate and we pass in the argument of self. So we'll add a comment to say calculate distance to next waypoint. So it's actually similar to what I've done previously but I'm not using vectors anymore. So I'll just say dist is equal to self.target minus self.pause. Then we'll add a comment here to say, use distance to calculate angle. And this is where we use that math module to calculate the angle. So we'll say self.angle is equal to, and I'll set this up in steps. So first of all, we'll say math.atan2, and here we need to pass the y distance and the x distance. So we need to break this down into its two individual components. So for the y distance, we'll say dist at index one, and for the x, it's dist at index zero. Now, because the y coordinate is flipped in Pygame, it starts from top and goes down to the bottom, we need to invert this by saying minus. Now this will give us an answer in radians. We need to convert that into degrees. So we'll say math.degrees, and then wrap all of that in brackets. Now that we've got the angle worked out, we can rotate the image. But if we keep rotating the same image over and over, then over time we're going to lose quality in the image. So what we actually have to do is keep the original image and then rotate that image every time. So as well as this self.image variable, we'll say self.original image is equal to image. I will also define a starting angle. So we'll say self.angle is equal to zero. And I can use that angle and the original image to update this self.image variable. We'll remove that and we'll say pg.transform.rotate. And what we're rotating is the original image and we're rotating it by that angle of self.angle. And now we will run this section of code every time we want to rotate the image. So I can actually just copy this from here and move it down into our rotate method. So just underneath where we've worked out the angle, I'll add a comment to say rotate image and update rectangle. Then I can paste that in and it's going to do the same thing as before. But now I have a new angle, so it's going to have a new image. We take a rectangle from that and we we'll reposition it at this self.pause variable. We can actually remove that from this move method from above just to tidy things up. And of course, with this new method defined, we need to actually call it somewhere. Well, we've got this update method here, and that's what I'm going to house all the remaining methods inside of. So I'll say self.rotate. So that means that when we call this update method from the game loop, it will follow on and call these by itself. So we go back in here, and now we run this again, and you can see that this time the enemy rotates and it faces the target that it's moving towards. 